Greetings, denizens of the Empire, and greetings to all of you who may be coming from the other various kingdoms, uh, well, I mean, YouTube channels that have contributed to this playlist. If this is your first stop, I'd like to welcome you all to South of the Sahara, or the Empire from Nothing's first official mass collaboration. Firstly, I'd like to thank all of the amazing creators who partook in this initiative, as the purpose of this project is to essentially do what Project Africa attempted to do a few years ago, and that is to bring together several amazing history-focused YouTubers in a collective effort to provide a wealth of content centered around African history. However, as the name of this playlist implies, we will be taking a refined approach, focusing exclusively on Africa south of the Sahara, a region that tends to be all but ignored and overshadowed in favor of the northern region of the continent, and Eurasia, of course. Our goal is to provide you, the viewer, with some excellent info and knowledge about the history of this underrepresented region, all the while steering clear of the usual tragic or negative themes that tend to dominate popular media. We plan to focus on the many positive and interesting aspects of Africa's rich and ancient history. Personally, I will be focusing on a topic that may surprise many of you who are beginners to the topic of African history. Contrary to popular belief, the people of Sub-Saharan Africa have been deeply immersed in maritime trade since times immemorial. Their unique construction of indigenous boats collectively known as sewn boats bear true testament to this, a construction technique that consists of planks held together tightly by cordage, which differs significantly from that of European vessels, which tend to have a rigid hull held together by iron nails. We will talk more on the physical attributes of these vessels later. This indigenous technique of boat building allowed African sailors to explore the world and trade with the people and lands as far away as China, long before Europeans could even muster such a voyage. Despite this, most history books tend to ignore this fact entirely and focus their writings on the voyages of people like Marco Polo, despite the fact that his expedition took place centuries after an already well-established and deep-seated maritime trade existed between Africa and Asia. So today, we will attempt to remedy this and spread this underappreciated fact with the world. Contact between African and Asian civilizations has been taking place since before the beginning of recorded history. African cereal crops like millet and sorghum were domesticated in early Shang, while Asian crops like banana and rice were domesticated in Africa at similarly early times. Given the wide distribution of these crops outside of their historical homelands, it is evident that they had been adopted at a very early time in history. Aside from this fact, however, research and evidence on early contact between these distinct regions of the world remains scant, and just how direct or indirect it occurred remains open for debate until further evidence is discovered. I just want to briefly shout out Happy Hippo Herbals for making this video possible. Happy Hippo Herbals is a provider of numerous alternative medicine products, some of which I use regularly to help me stay focused and feel less anxious in my daily life. If you use my referral link or referral code FN10, you can receive a 15% discount on all Happy Hippo Herbals products. Go to fromnothing.info slash market for my affiliate link and for links to other partners that I've worked with in the past. While it is not known precisely where East African sea vessels originated, the earliest ships of East Africa that exhibit clear ocean-going capabilities are known through a depiction from Egyptian Queen Hatshepsut's great expedition to the Kingdom of Punt around 1500 BC. While it's also not known where the land of Punt was, it is believed to have existed in Sub-Saharan Africa in the region around Somalia or Ethiopia, or what is often dubbed as the Horn of Africa. These vessels consisted of papyriform hull similar to the riverboats used throughout the Nile Valley for millennia. However, they appeared to be structurally strengthened for the rough waters of the sea, with three notable features that emphasized their use as open sea vessels. The hogging truss, through beams, and stitching of the hull. Other depictions at the Deir el-Bahari temple show one of the largest ships 
ever constructed in the ancient world, capable of carrying massive obelisks weighing up to 350 tons. This ship carried multiple tiers of through beams, hogging trusses, and lashes which were crucial to its structural integrity during these heavy workloads. However, despite its design, like virtually all other Egyptian boats throughout the millennia, it was designed only for rivering use. More documentation of East African maritime vessels was recorded by an unknown Egyptian Greek trader who wrote the Periplus of the Erythraean, a guide to sailors, sometime in the middle of the first century CE or only a few decades after the birth of Christ. In this writing, he described the presence of several sewn boats along the East African coast regularly being spotted on long-distance voyages. He described them around a place called Minutheus Island, which modern historians often interpret as the island of Pemba around the Zanzibar archipelago. However, he doesn't mention any of these vessels containing sails. The island has sewn boats and dugout canoes that are used for fishing and for catching turtles. Two runs beyond this island, comes the very last port of the trade on the coast of Azania, called Rapta, a name derived from the aforementioned sewn boats. Like the island of Manutheus, the port of Rapta has also not been precisely identified by modern historians, but it is believed to have existed somewhere around the Rufiji Delta in what is now Tanzania. While later historical sources of East African boat building practices are scarce, the tradition was still evidently widely distributed. One strong maritime player of East African commerce was the Aksumite Empire. There is little direct evidence of boats being built in Ethiopia, but their maritime power and influence is quite conspicuous. At the height of their power in the first few centuries CE, Aksum controlled much of what are now the countries of Ethiopia and Eritrea, as well as lands that transcended the Red Sea, well into the southern Arabian Peninsula or what is now known today as Yemen. In 522 CE, a Yemeni ruler by the name of Du Nuwas led a rebellion against the Aksumites and emerged victorious after receiving aid from the Sassanid Empire. In turn, King Caleb of Aksum requested assistance from the Byzantine Empire, which was promptly answered in the form of ships and supplies. In 525, the Aksumite army sailed across the Red Sea once more to march on the small kingdom, killing Du Nuwas and reinstalling an Aksumite ruler in his place. Further evidence of Aksum's maritime influence comes in the form of large hordes of Aksumite coins found as far away as India. In the 8th century, Muslim armies took the Dalek Islands from the Aksumite Empire. The Adulis port was also destroyed around this time effectively undermining Aksumite dominance over maritime trade and influence in the Red Sea and cutting it off from the rest of the world outside of the African continent for centuries to come. Numerous other traditions of sewn vessels can be found all throughout the Horn of Africa, including the Somali Bedin, which can be constructed for purposes of fishing or much larger ocean-going vessels designed for trading which bordered one to two masts and could reach over 50 feet in length. They had short and stout lateen sails, and their anchors consisted of oval-shaped slabs of stone, with one hole for a wooden rod serving as a fluke, and another hole for the cable. The more familiar iron grapnel anchor could also be used instead. The construction of these ships included a watertight caulking consisting of pitch, which sealed the seams of the sewn portions of the boat. The stitching required replacing every 10 years but the boat itself was composed of high-quality timber that was capable of lasting several decades. In fact, the one shown in these images was said to be 70 years old at the time that the photographs were taken. However, this may very well be an exaggeration. The Bedin is, however, the longest-lasting sewn boat tradition, as all others have been replaced by Western-style boats. While African sewn boats are prone to leaking, they do have some advantages over the rigid vessels commonly in use today, as their unique construction method allows for more flexibility, which is a quite notable advantage along the East African coast, as dangerous coral reefs are endemic to the region and would tear a more rigidly built vessel to shreds. In fact, this coral was so prevalent that it was harvested and used for building materials in many Swahili towns, 
which may be hard to tell at first glance as dead coral is visually and structurally similar to stone. Many of these coral structures actually still stand to present day. Stone boat construction has also been documented farther inland with vessels that were used in Africa's largest lake, Lake Victoria. While these were not ocean-going vessels, they were still used in open water rather than rivers. In fact, several kingdoms collectively known as the Great Lakes Kingdoms including Buganda and Banyoro are well documented to have possessed formidable navies and partook in many naval battles within the Great Lakes of East Africa. Moving back to the East African coast, we encounter one of the most widespread varieties of ocean-going vessels in the history of the continent. In what is now known as Faza in the Lamu Archipelago of modern-day Kenya, a prominent boat-building industry flourished, a type of boat known as the Mtepe, simply meaning boat in the Swahili language. These boats were part of the largest maritime trade network in the world during the Middle Ages, sometimes referred to as the Silk Road of the Sea, was only surpassed in scale and wealth with the advent of the Portuguese caravel. This complex network's reliance on the Asian and African monsoon winds provided swift and effective trade winds for sailors that followed a consistent and reliable schedule for merchants to follow. Like the aforementioned Bedin found farther north in the Horn of Africa, the Mtepe is a term used to collectively describe a distinct tradition of closely related ships associated with a particular culture, which in this case would be the Swahili, a people belonging to the Bantu linguistic group. Also, as with the Bedin, some were used for fishing while others were used for long-distance ocean-going trade, with the latter being much larger in size. In fact, some vessels have been documented reaching lengths of 40 to 75 feet and would usually carry a burthen between 12 and 50 tons. However, the maximum capacity was likely much higher as one 19th century vessel was reported to be just 30 meters in length but had a burthen of 186 tons. This cargo capacity was so profound that Mtepe ships have been documented shipping giraffes, elephants, and other large African animals across the Indian Ocean to lands as far away as India and China in the 15th century. Between the years of 1417 and 1419, a giraffe, an oryx, and a zebra were reportedly shipped to China from Malindi thanks to this well-established seafaring network. While Zheng He's gargantuan treasure ships tend to hog the spotlight for this trade network, Swahili traders have been documented to have been prominent participants in the trade itself, building, navigating, and stocking their own ships of indigenous manufacture. Various Swahili city-states partook in this trade, as evidenced by Chinese porcelain unearthed frequently throughout the region. Ming Dynasty era porcelain has even been discovered as far inland as Great Zimbabwe, a monumental stone city that served as the capital of a kingdom that was hundreds of miles from the coast, indicating that it arrived via overland trade routes from Swahili merchants who in turn would receive gold, ivory, and other expensive African goods. Virtually every medium to large settlement along the Swahili coast bears archaeological evidence of Chinese stoneware and porcelain. Coins from the Kelwa Sultanate, which was perhaps the most powerful Swahili kingdom to have ever existed, have been discovered as far away as Australia, though it is not abundantly clear just how they got there. They could have possibly been placed there in recent times as a hoax or could have washed up on shore from shipwrecked Kilwa merchants in the Indian Ocean. East African iron was also a major export of these kingdoms as well and their traditional practices were among the most advanced in the world. In fact, the open hearth furnace was invented in Tanzania, independent of outside influence, nearly 2,000 years prior to its invention in the West. In the year 912 CE, Arab scholar al-Masudi had this to say about the iron industry of East Africa in his book, The Meadows of Gold and the Mines of Gems. The Zanj exported gold, silver, iron, ivory, tortoiseshell, and slaves. Iron was probably the source of the largest profits. Indian merchants came to buy iron and took it back to their own country where they resold it to the manufacturers of iron weapons. The Zanja Malini owned and worked iron mines, as did other towns, but Malindi must have been the most important. 
East African iron was much valued in India, partly because there was no lack of supply and partly because it was of good quality, yet easy to fashion and they became masters of the skill of working. The Indians were said to make better swords than anyone else and weapons made of iron of the Zanj were used throughout the Middle East and countries of the Indian Ocean. In any respect, the legacy of this extensive maritime trade network can be found in various populations throughout East Africa, the Arabian Peninsula, and South Asia, all the way up to the present day. The Sidi people, for example, are a population of blacks inhabiting India and Pakistan who descend from East Africans who settled in the region throughout the Middle Ages. Many were slaves, but others were descended from sailors, merchants, and mercenaries. In fact, many were directly descended from various Indian kingdoms that were ruled by African men. Throughout Indian history, these Africans were collectively referred to as Habshi, a Hindi corruption of the word Habesha, denoting people of Ethiopian stock but could be used to refer to any and all black Africans. These Africans had a foundational impact on the political landscape of much of medieval Indian history, with Malik Ambar being just one of many notable examples of powerful Habshi men. Moving back over to East Africa, Pate Island found within the Lamu Archipelago, Kenya, mentioned earlier, has a population that displays evidence of intimate contact with Chinese merchants of the past. Early Portuguese explorers were quite impressed by the high quality silk manufactured on the island. Chinese geneticists visiting the island in the mid 1990s successfully revealed that the people on the island possessed substantial ancestry from medieval Chinese populations. An oral history describes Chinese sailors being shipwrecked on the island and intermarrying with the local population. Chinese porcelain and Chinese inscriptions on gravestones all corroborate this story as well. In conclusion, Africa was not this monolithic land of primitive villagers lost in time in an isolated land. The people of East Africa, from ancient Egypt all the way down to Tanzania, well within what we consider to be sub-Saharan Africa, had ancient traditions of maritime contact with the ancient world. Lands such as China and India were regular and integral trade partners long before the same could be said about European powers. By every right, these African people were building, navigating, and controlling trade routes independent of foreign intervention and had been doing so for well over 1,000 years. I hope you all enjoyed this historical summary of the maritime traditions of East Africa. And if you want more excellent African history content, be sure to enjoy the remainder of these videos compiled in South of the Sahara, a playlist created by the collective effort of these fantastic YouTubers. Be sure to give them lots of likes, comments, and subscriptions while you're at it. Oh, and always remember, we don't come from nothing.